It is night. The moon is there. The music begins in dry bushland, bristling from the rough skin of Australia. Not much thunder is heard in the inland of Australia. Around the coastline it is heard when water hugging the earth sends on its moon-drawn tides to crash against the land, beating against the thrust-up arms of rock, and the crushed-up foam of breakers races to the beaches like a horde of angry rats. But in the inland there is not much thunder. Sometimes there is the distant rumble of massed kangaroos in flight. Sometimes there is the fierce night dancing of forgotten men. Almost always there is silence. And there is silence now. And briefly the bland and stupefying moon eases the land of the torment of the drought. The days are dry and hard, and the animals suffer. But now, for a few hours, snakes are loosely coiled, wombats sleep in their holes, birds' beaks sag in the trees, and the flies are still. A road runs through this part of the country. Near it is the quiet preparation for another sort of thunder. A bottle lies here, brown, unbroken. Tomorrow it will bend 30 square inches of summer sunlight into five. This will go on for some hours. Before noon, more than 1,200 square miles of bushland will be totally destroyed. But for the time, the flies sleep and the birds are cool and the wombats are dozing heaps in their holes. Now the dawn, the beginning again, the Australian bush dawn, the quietest pageant of the earth. The sun, not yet seen, begins to sketch designs of rock and hill. A silver edging slowly marks out sacks and rims of cloud. The tips of trees begin the day's thinking while their roots still lie asleep. The first bird calls are over. The crest of a ridge grows sharp, and the side in darkness for a time grows darker, and the air becomes warmer with every minute. 
In a paddock sheep have woken and are standing, moving slowly over their land as the foam of calm water might move over rocks and sandbars. Animals and birds are busy early. One of the busiest is the wombat. He has to be busy because he's so slow. For him, it takes the whole long day to get any sort of work done. There's food to get and stones to dig and a bit of the burrow to mend. There are leaves to find for his tunnels and things to visit. The Wombat. The Wombat comes from a pleasant family, fussy and gentle, slow-minded and polite. He's a close cousin of the koala bear who took to the trees a long time back to get away from it all. The Wombat has a duck-billed tail and a duck-billed nose and a duck-billed mental life. He's ponderous plump of meat with a lurching walk. Everything likes a waddler. The wombat lurches on, slowly minding his own business. There's bits of bark to find and things to visit. And everything likes a waddle and crump and slowly home to dinner on time and gentle doze in a well-made hole and early thoughtless yawns and waddle and crump again. If an animal's walk could suggest any words, they'd be these. I'm good morning to everything. Isn't it nice familiar earth? I'm waddling on and I like to crump. I'm ponderous plump of meat and that suits me. I'm a waddler and slow, and I'm timid and stupid. I waddle on and I waddle slow, and even waddling nowhere, I still like waddling on. It's good that the bush is kind to the wombat. The trundling snout is pushed along by the high ungainly rump. And from there, from a wombat snout view, the world perhaps seems strange. But nothing would want to hurt him. The wombat has no enemy. He gathers up a bit of bark and a kangaroo jumps by. The kangaroo, grotesque, fierce, tender, graceful, with a whip-strong paws that fling the small and delicate face upwards through the air in splendid arcs. The great prongs of paws bend up and crash their downward thrust at the end of every curve. In the eyes of the tiny soaring head, there is the fixedness of distance, and behind the eyes there lies an old, old knowledge of an antique land. The wombat looks at him leap and blinks his eyes. <laughs> The wombat almost stumbles over a brown round thing of glass. That's what comes of trying to think and letting the waddle and crump take care of itself. The big rump tumbles from side to side as he goes along to find more bark. Unconcerned, the friend of all the bush moves away from the prism of glass that will lead to the killing of almost every living thing in the bush before 12 o'clock. The sun pours onto the bottle near the road, half past eight. The curve of the glass bends the sun's light to a slim searing line across the dry leaves underneath. 
the edges of the leaves begin to curl. On the way back to his hole, the wombat hears a muttering in the trees. He's waddling underneath koala cousin, who sits and nibbles a gum tip on a branch. Not many koalas left now, because there aren't many gum tips left, and only these can keep the koala alive. There are many small bears dead on the ground because drought has stifled the eucalypts. The wombat surely likes koalas, furry and round with flat painted noses, as inoffensive as himself. Half past nine, the jagged leaf edges blacken. Steadily, the sunlight curves to its scythe edge, one foot long. At the edge of his hole, the wombat lurches over a brown bush snake. The snake, knowing perhaps that the wombat's eyesight isn't very good, slithers himself away. Everything likes a waddler. Ten o'clock. The base of the bottle cracks off with a sharp, small explosion. A brief flicker of flame. The wombat trundles the sand away, using his nose as a spade. Then he lies on his side to dig and mend his burrow. He makes a much better job of it than the impatient rabbit. Half past ten. A puddle of fire spreads round the bottle. The glass shatters. The wombat doesn't keep any sort of lookout. He doesn't need to. Only an inexperienced dingo might attack him. The wombat can hurt the dingo. He backs tail end first into a fight. And the dingo learns that teeth have no effect on thick, fat encrusted hide. The wombat waits till the moment comes to jerk himself around and sideways cracking the dingo's skull against a log or a stump. A quarter to eleven. A flashing of a wagtail in the air. The wombat grunts and the wagtail carries off to his nest his small beak full of fur. But the wombat doesn't mind, and he backs himself against his tunnel wall to press the sand down. Then he's off with Waddle and Crump to find a stone. Thunder has begun. A eucalypt explodes, and there is the first temple of flame. Flames spread through the undergrowth and send up blossoms of fine ash. On a distant farm, cocks crow at midday. The roaring startles rabbits and they scamper to their burrows. The flames lash out at neighboring trees like the tails of angry cats. A mushroom of muddy smoke covers the sky. The sun is a far off scarlet disc. Scalding sap splinters bark casings. 
A short round thing of glass has woken the terror of the ages. Eleven o'clock, and it's one long bellow of fire. The snake that let the wombat go makes hysterical whiplash patterns in the air and hisses out his life. The dingo, cunning and unconquerable, unconquerable through his cunning, turns to watch the screaming dance of the approaching fire. The tutorship of his line of sires and of his own experience crowds forward in his mind. The dingo is the knotting up of nature into a cord of hard, unframed toughness. He is savage. He is resolution without concession. He is animal that masters. He is ruthlessness, courage and majesty. The dingo stands. He pants easily now and waits. He saves his breath and his blood. He alone has a chance to live. The long, old knowledge of his line of sires moves into the strong spread paws of the heavy muscled jaws. He must race through the fire. Others will race away from it, turn from it. The wombat, cut off from his burrows, will try to reach the only river left with water by the drought. The koala cannot escape. He will, of course, fight for life in the prison to which he has committed himself, the trees that grow the only food that he can live by. The kangaroo may have a better chance. His huge legs might be faster than the fire. Even if the wombat turned, went through the fire, he still might be too slow, and the wombat is very slow. But the dingo has a chance, and he lies down now as the fire approaches, flops on his chest and splays out his paws, and pants very easily to save his heart. He closes his eyes and listens to the flames. The marvelous fine mesh of muscle at the root of either ear manipulates the pointed shapes with delicate precision. In perhaps three minutes, his contest will come. There's a waddle and half a crump, and the wombat stops and stares at a tree. There's a sound in his ears that he's heard before. Something is wrong. A dingo canters past and he has his mouth shut. And where have the rabbits gone? They're always flying in and around the bushes, but there aren't any now. The kangaroos seem to be bounding to a gathering somewhere behind him. The air has grown warmer and he has heard this noise before. Go back to the burrow. Crouching without a sound in the darkness he has tunneled into the earth is safety. But his burrows are there where the noise is. Noise. And the air getting hot. And the animals gone. The blaze has blackened 80 yards of land. In the next hour it will burn out 20 miles. It isn't a fast fire yet, 20 miles in an hour. But that's too fast for many of the beings of the bush. For the wombat, half a mile in an hour, it's much too fast. The wombat pushes up his head. Smoke chokes his nostrils. With waddle and crump, he moves ten paces on. Still there's smoke. His duck-billed nose is damp as the smoke strains out his tear ducts to protect his eyes. The river is half a mile away and his instincts tell him, there. And with waddle and crump and lurching on, he begins to see it, twisted through the shimmer of smoke and tears. It's very much hotter now, but the lurching can't be faster, and the rump, so much higher than the trundling, weeping head, grows hot. If his fat weren't covered by hide, it would flash into flame. Nothing matters now but desperate crump and waddle, and the river still ninety yards away. The fire a half of a mile behind, the river ninety yards ahead. No odds for a wombat. He's not an animal to survive the bush when it thunders this way. Dozens of his koala cousins have died in the trees. They couldn't move, of course, but they clung on hard to the branches as the skin was burnt like fresh wet paint from their snouts, gripped on hard till their hearts were stopped with smoke. And they fell like small round torches, 
lost in the flame. At first, the kangaroo easily outpaced the fire. With a lope of 40 miles in an hour, he has kept the flames well behind him. The snakes and the koalas die, the dingoes wait their chance, the kangaroo leaps on and rests, and then takes up again his ancient choreography of limbs and head. The black smoke thickens in front of his face, and the thunder behind the wombat blots out the noise of the racing fires in the undergrowth. These will reach him first and destroy him. The line of flame spans over 13 miles, a holocaust that knows nothing of the wombat. Dingo moves himself to his feet with the shouting flame 200 yards away. He shakes himself briefly like a dog and then tilts back his head with the action of a wolf and he starts forth, moving easily to meet the fire. And as he moves, his body sinks lower and the paws work harder on the ground, giving an athlete's rhythm, working harder. And then the long lean head sits low and the body gathers speed with a powerful galloping action of the paws. And seconds before he meets the flames, the dingo reaches cheetah speed and plunges through them, eyes shut, head thrust down between the flashing forward legs. <laughs> Over the whole land, the sky is shut out. Life is whipped from trees in the space of seconds. An avalanche of burning sends the air into a frenzy. Now to feed the thunder comes a wind, and the 20 miles in an hour are turned to 70. The flames have trapped the flying kangaroos. They're tough and they leap with instinct, and before they die, they smell the sweet, strange scent of roasting flesh. Their mighty paws still strike the ground while their heads loll downward in death, jerking with each shudder of the body. Then the crash, sudden and complete, no threshing on the ground, with the tiny head slewed back, and the flames feed. yards ahead of his snout now, just seven yards. Lurch and crump have sunk to slovenly heave and slide. The flames have washed over him twice and there are little scrub fires in his fur. The smoke has made him sob to catch his breath and the heavy continual sobbing takes up most of his last strength. His eyes are blind with hot fluid, but his snout detects the river five yards on. And his last fragments of life tell him, there. The flames find him out again. He cries out in blind agony, high squealing that doesn't match the lumpy body. He slumps forward. The fire mounts over him. His small shrieks are drowned by the noise. And then, with a capricious change of wind, the fire sweeps back and soon is half a mile away. The wombat is left in the smoking bush undetectable black among black, still breathing, almost dead, a travesty of wombat. 
And yet there is a lurch. Waddling won't be possible again. There's no strength left for Crump. And there's another lurch. He makes the miracle of reaching the river. Slowly he slides underwater. A mile away, a dingo sleeps, badly burned but living on. Close around and much further away, there is death in the forms of shattered trees, grotesquely twisted kangaroos, goannas and koalas, birds and rabbits and snakes. moves to a soft death now. His fat, charred rump bobs slowly above the water as he drowns. The last thing that he dimly knows is the gentle easing of his terrible burns. A gesture, perhaps, to the friend of all the bush, to the meekness of waddle and crump. When the sun sets, the thunder has gone. The moon 